Our next speaker, Dr. Jeremy Hoffman, is the Chief Scientist at the Science Museum of Virginia. His work on city and urban environments has been widely cited and showcases how climate and heat drastically impact some neighborhoods over others. We welcome him today to share his work and perspective. Jeremy? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you, thanks. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so first of all, I want to acknowledge Nickham. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. And um, I would, you know, following Charles Lee um, on a webinar uh, is truly um, an honor and a privilege. And then to share space with the folks that you'll hear from the uh, Greensboro Housing Coalition is also um, a, just a, a joy. Uh, so thanks everybody for your attention and um, I want to share a little bit today about just this enduring legacy of inequitable exposure to climate stressors. You heard Charles bring up the idea of redlining as a potential lens for interpreting this inequity. And I'll, I'll share a little bit about that and some recent work that we've been doing at the Science Museum of Virginia um, and, and trying to, to highlight and understand and then use that information to, to, um, to, to you know, efficiently dispatch resources um, both before the COVID crisis and then now using the same lessons that we've learned through studying heat and air um, in the COVID world. So uh, I'm first, because I don't think I know a lot of the people on this call, I want to introduce myself a little bit. Um, so I grew up uh, in the northwestern suburbs of Chicago, Illinois, um, and you know, being a white middle class family, uh, we enjoyed a lot of the privileges afforded to those um, families in the 90s, uh, including, you know, regular visits to the pool. It's me and my brother there. Uh, and, you know, here on the right, uh, an embarrassing chapter for sure in the choice of haircut. But nonetheless, that was the year uh, 1995. That was um, the, the year of the famous Chicago heat wave um, that unfortunately killed, uh, or, you know, over 700 people. Um, and mostly in elderly communities of color uh, that were that are, you know, really kind of disconnect. Were disconnected from their uh, communities. There's a really good study of this from Eric Eric Kleinenberg. It's a book um, called Heat Wave, and then a recent PBS special um, called Cooked: Survival by Zip Code. Um, because I lived that, you know, we I was enjoying an outdoor yard party. Uh, in my backyard with air conditioning and slip and slides and all the all that when just a few miles away on the other side of town people were suffering um, mortality and significant morbidity um, uh, illnesses related to this heat wave where you know temperatures topped 114 degrees for and didn't go down below I think like 85 for several nights in a row and then we all know that uh, you know as healthcare professionals and especially people with an interest in in um, you know, like the air quality and its impact on the respiratory system, like any underlying respiratory issue, something like COPD or asthma, is exacerbated by heat and humidity, and that that can constrict um, airways and make it harder to um, to breathe overall as the um, you know the heat and humidity goes up. And then you add on top of that this kind of pollution, uh, things like PM 2.5. You heard Charles um, very expertly explain that there's some disproportionate exposure to those sorts of pollutants. But these are also things like NO2 and, uh, and then industrial pollution as well. So these three things, heat and, and pollution and underlying health issues, really tether me to um, this study of, uh, of my urban microclimates. Because we know that heat and humidity don't, uh, just like pollution, don't express themselves the same ways across an urban landscape. And I don't think that there's a better way to explain that than showing you a picture out of my office um, at, at, here in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, and I want you all on the call that are watching this slide to make a hypothesis. Of course, being from a science museum, uh, you can't escape making a hypothesis during a webinar. So when you think to yourself, we're going to fly into this picture like we were on the, uh, at, you know, the um, – school bus, the magic school bus, where would you go to find the warmest place to the touch? You know, where would you go uh, into, you know, think, think, about, think about where you might go for the, the hottest place. And then on the same side, uh, where would you go to find the coolest spot to the touch? And I hope, uh, you know, you're kind of 
thinking about maybe these different colors have something to do with it, maybe the, the trees have something to do with it, maybe these native plants. And what's really fascinating is that we spent a lot of time at the Science Museum of Virginia learning how to interpret how the natural and built world uh, can either amplify or dampen heat extremes. And so, so this picture was taken with a FLIR thermal camera, a really re reasonably priced and really engaging uh, uh, public tools for uh, studying heat extremes. And so one, a couple things pop out in this picture is that the asphalt's the hot, hottest thing, you know, these dense, impervious, um, dark surfaces actually absorb more of the sun's energy throughout the day and then re-emit it back into the air as heat throughout the afternoon and into the evening. And then uh, that's actually what gives rise to the urban heat island effect or the idea that an entire urban area can be several, if not tens of degrees warmer than, uh, than their outlying rural areas. But then there's some really interesting things uh, about like the colors of the cars here having different um, uh, heat signatures, as well as the type of plants you know, these big mature oak trees on the far left of the screen versus the native plant garden being cooler than the non-native grasses. You know, these non-native grasses make up a large portion of our public spaces and they can be just as hot as the sidewalk next to them. Um, so this one photo, I could do an entire webinar, I think, about the built environment and how it amplifies heat. But unfortunately, we can't spend too much time. But when, if you were to think about like zooming out, like going on a, a Google map, and think about like this balance between the natural environment, these green things, versus the dark and hard surfaces. And think about your own city and kind of fly above it. And does, does, what we might learn from this is that we need more shade versus less hardscape. And do we design our cities that way? So zooming up to the atmospheric level uh, over the city of Richmond and using the National Land Cover Database tree canopy percentage map from 2011, we can see that while we might quote tree canopy percentages over the course of the whole city, depending on where you are on a given day, you can have a tree nearby <clears throat> or absolutely no shade to speak of. Uh, and so there, the shade canopy uh, around Richmond varies from as little as five to upwards of 80% uh, uh, across the city's landscape. And so knowing that these areas that might have less trees uh, may or may not amplify heat. We went out with a bunch of volunteers in a community science project in 2017 to physically measure the city's temperature using these um, uh, kind of sophisticated um, uh, thermometers that are taking measurements of where we are in space and the air temperature every single second. And by dispatching a bunch of cars around the city all at once following a methodology that was adapted by Vivek Shandas at Portland State University and colleagues um, we uh, volunteered a, or a bunch of these nonprofits and university partners in the city sustainability office got together dispatching a bunch of cars around the city. We discovered that there was a 16 degree Fahrenheit difference between the warmest and coolest place at the exact same time during a heat wave in 2017. And this happens to be at 3 to 4 p.m. And we know from looking at medical records that this 3 to 4 p.m. hour is when most of our physical um, heat-related health burden is occurring um, during this hottest part of the day. And you can see that this is kind of the inverse picture of that uh, tree canopy map, whereby the areas with significantly less tree canopy are those with the significantly amplified heat extremes. Now, we um, had to look at this in a more, um, you know, kind of health-minded way uh, once we started showing uh, you know, members of our local uh, policymaking world and, and, you know, advocates for environmental justice, we had to look at, well, what are the exact health burdens? And so working with the VDH and the Richmond Ambulance Authority, I mean, the Virginia Department of Health, ongoing work with them, we've been able to diagnose where uh, heat-related illness responses uh, go to the most. And so this is a map here on the right of only heat-related illness illness ambulance responses over the last five years, and you can see the correspondence between these two maps is, uh, is, is increasingly or striking. Um, now, uh, most of these uh, heat-related illness responses, 60% uh, of them befall uh, uh, black and brown communities where they only make up about 47% of the population in the city of Richmond. And even by um, uh, normalizing by population density, this relationship still holds and so we're working on an ongoing relationship with VDH to understand this more deeply. Then thinking about this from the side of respiratory health, you can see the overlap of places that amplify extreme heat during the summer are the same places that experience higher rates of adults with asthma. This is also true of other respiratory issues 
um, and we'll get back to that in a second. But I want to focus in on a little bit that you heard from Charles um, in that uh, our urban heat islands overlap with uh, uh, parts of the city that were um, physically red lines in the 1930s. This was a, um, a federally uh, supported program where uh, assessors were allowed to go out into individual neighborhoods around uh, over 200 American cities uh, and rate their residential security along a spectrum of perceived safety for investment. But as we can look at individually here in, in, the, in the city of Richmond, it wasn't so much necessarily about the residential security as it was about who was living there because this is the uh, area of the city which is known as Jackson Ward, Carver, uh, and Newtown East, and several of the um, uh, communities uh, in the kind of north, near north side of Richmond, where the type of inhabitant was referred to as 95% Negro, and then very, very little else was explained about this particular neighborhood. Just on the other side of the city, um, Windsor, Windsor Farms, on the other hand, the type of inhabitant was listed as the best people. So upon closer investigation of these maps around the country, we realized that this has nothing to do with necessarily the residential security in the sense of financial, but really who is living there and, um, and the perception of those communities as being worthwhile for investment. This is now cascaded into several econo measurable economic and environmental um, uh, uh, differ differences in, in, in equities, including this one that we published back in January, um, where we took satellite imagery of the surface temperatures of cities, averaged out where those uh, temperatures vary across those different ratings from A to D, with D being the red line communities. It, here in Richmond, we've kind of the first test case was that it was warmer in formerly redlined areas. And this was diagnosed by an imbalance of fewer trees as well as experiencing more impervious surfaces, which of course, this also leads to additional uh, environmental stressors like the capacity to hold storm water during extreme rainfall events, which are also becoming more extreme. But um, when we zoomed out to the entire country, we had to amalgamate some of the cities into particular urban areas because they fell within the same Landsat tile. But we ended up with 108 cities in our study, and the uh, formerly redlined areas are approximately five degrees Fahrenheit warmer than their um, green lined neighbors. Uh, and this has significant uh, changes around the country based on which uh, kind of uh, region of the city, uh, of the country you are. And this is largely explained by variations in the available tree canopy and the relative preponderance of dark hard surfaces and pervious surfaces across them. Now, why is now there's been a, like a flourish of attention on these HLC risk grade uh, disparities, including this one, which was published just a couple weeks after ours from Anthony Nardoni at uh, Berkeley in the Lancet, which uh, investigated how um, at, at age adjusted asthma rates uh, or visits in emergency department in urgent care centers varied across these different um, uh, or these different HLC grades. And much like our heat signal, it increases uh, almost, you know, lockstep with the um, perceived residential security back in almost 80 years ago. So it's incredible that these, um, these kind of uh, judgment calls on these communities is now echoing as uh, disparate health and environmental outcomes, including here in Richmond. So I wanted to show an application of, we've now digitized on the um, Esri uh, RTS online platform, you can go and use these maps uh, freely um, to investigate environmental disparity in your own city. You can also um, visit bit.ly slash uh, red hot cities and investigate more about our ongoing work with the redlining uh, and extreme heat. But if I overlay um, uh, those redlining data with EJ screen indexes, uh, like the respiratory health index from 2018, uh, the disparity um, becomes quite uh, quite clear in that the risk for um, respiratory health index has higher percentages in those red line communities, as well as um, something like traffic proximity. This isn't necessarily a surprise given that places that were redlined served as a, as a map for where to um, to demolish historically black communities and build. Um, highways that allowed white communities to flee back into the surrounding countryside and c counties surrounding them. And so I want to tie this eventually back to uh, work that we're going, that's ongoing in the city of Richmond via the RVA Green 2050 plan. This is an equity-centered climate action plan for the city of Richmond, and you can access information about it at rvagreen2050.com. We've um, 
with their uh, analysts, GIS analysts, we developed a heat vulnerability index, which has allowed us to, um, to assess where vulnerable populations might be, including underlying health, access to adaptive capacity in the sense of air conditioning and uh, those sorts of things. And what we started to look at uh, after um, the onset of COVID was developing a COVID risk map, uh, which looks like this, and it combines both the risk of uh, being exposed to uh, COVID-19 or the coronavirus and the severity of um, uh, an underlying kind of health a predetermining a severe, an extremely severe case. And it wasn't your eyes tricking you. Um, the heat vulnerability map and our COVID-19 risk maps look almost identical. And this points to that underlying structural uh, inequality in both in the social determinants of health that predetermine um, survivability in our urban areas, including here in the city of Richmond, Virginia. So the Science Museum of Virginia is leading a, um, a community science program now called RV Air, and we're working with um, the, our local DEQ, as well as uh, the University of Virginia and Virginia Tech and VCU and U of R to understand how these disparities uh, exist within our cities, and then most importantly, how they feed back on the health and well-being of our residents. So we're actually going out over the next two weeks um, to test how people's heart rate variation and stress levels vary between uh, different urban forms and contexts uh, while there's still some heat left to squeeze out of the summer. So with that, I, wanted to, I want to um, end and just say thank you so much for listening, and I'm such a pleasure again to follow uh, Charles and then to cede the rest of my time and the rest of the, the opportunity to hearing from the folks in Greensboro. So thank you so much.